liberation should flow from the bottom up, which is to say that the liberatory enterprise should begin with the most distressed and most disempowered and work its way up the social and economic ladder. For most people, including many social justice activists, this is counterintuitive. But just as you have to erect a building from the foundation up, so you have to construct liberation from the bottom up. The reason being that this is the only way to effectively challenge hierarchical patterns of thought. Top down challenges the symptoms, bottom up challenges the disease. To see how these principles might work in practice, let's consider two current issues involving sub-oppression. First, workers in slaughterhouses and animal factories, especially chicken and egg factories, are among the most oppressed in the industrialized world. Their working conditions are nothing short of obscene. Their pay is at the bottom of the scale, and they typically receive no benefits such as health insurance, paid leave, or retirement. Many are undocumented residents who are reluctant to report safety and health violations or pay shortages for fear of deportation. And yet they are sub-oppressors because they are operating the most horrific concentration camps and death camps ever devised by human beings. In accordance with our first principle, we cannot condone their oppression of chickens, pigs, and other animals. And for that reason, we cannot support campaigns aimed at improving the salaries and working conditions of slaughterhouse and factory farm workers. We must not make torture and murder attractive occupations. On the other hand, we must recognize and respond to the oppression suffered by these workers. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, and so in keeping with the principle of providing compensatory benefits whenever it is not possible to recognize the interests of sub-oppressors and their victims, we should engage in campaigns to improve farm and slaughterhouse workers' lot outside the workplace, such as through education and training programs that would equip them to find jobs in other industries, through subsidized housing, food, and medical programs, through counseling and social services, and through legislation to provide a path to citizenship for undocumented residents that is easy, quick, and inexpensive. And finally, we must keep reiterating to them that while we cannot support them as oppressors, we do support them as victims. And we must impress upon them the fundamental principle that our most important membership is in the full community of sentient beings. This will not be an easy sell. They view their oppression correctly, even if superficially, as a function of their membership in an American underclass. But this is the essential point that we must insist upon if we are to eradicate the disease, which is moral hierarchy, rather than simply attack one symptom that will be quickly replaced by another symptom. For many of us, the second issue is closer to home. Although the situation has improved greatly in the last quarter century or so, even in the era of the Americans with Disabilities Act, persons with disabilities are still oppressed by a system that does the merest fraction of what it should to facilitate our full participation in the life of the society. And disabilities can also trigger collateral oppression, as in the case of caregivers who carry heavy physical and psychological burdens because society does not provide them with adequate resources and support. Many disability advocacy groups, especially groups whose advocacy focuses on a specific disease or injury, such as spinal cord injury or my own condition, myasthenia gravis, support biomedical research on non-human beings. By supporting this research, persons with disabilities and our loved ones and caregivers become sub-oppressors. And so the issue of biomedical research on non-human subjects must be addressed, at least in part, as a problem of sub-oppression. Following the first principle outlined above, we must not support research on non-human persons. 
Rather, we must witness to the principle that inflicting suffering and death on any being who is able to suffer and who fears death, even when undertaken for the most high-minded of purposes, is wrong. The lives and suffering of the animals who are used as research subjects are of equal value to the lives and sufferings of humans with disabilities. Following the third principle, we should campaign strenuously for vastly increased budgets for non-animal-based research, for the development of new computer-based and genetically-based research methods, for increased medical and social services, and for strengthened programs to routinize in the public mind the fullest participation possible by persons with disabilities in the economic, political, and social life of the community. All funded, perhaps, by sizable reductions to our ridiculously bloated military, prison, and immigration prevention budgets, and by raising the rates of the capital gains tax <coughs> to levels higher than the tax rates for earned income. Very briefly, two concluding thoughts. First, the fact that many compensatory benefits for suboppressors may not be immediately obtainable does not mean that suboppressors should be allowed to continue their oppressive activities until these benefits are available. But the reverse side of that coin is that we must continue to campaign for the compensatory benefits just as persistently after the sub oppressors have ceased to oppress others as we did before. Working for these benefits is not merely a matter of strategy, it is a matter of moral obligation. You have been a most attentive